As humans, we are obsessed with the unknown. Sordid tales of mystery, captivating romance, historical events that seem impossible, we are drawn to the macabre, the sublime. Today I'm going to dive into that obsession with the art piece called The Raft of the Medusa by Theodore Gericault. In this video, I'm going to cover the historical event that was depicted in this piece, and I'll do an analysis on The Raft of the Medusa and see how it was created to tap into our curiosity and draw us into the unknown. Real quick, make sure you subscribe to my channel, hit that bell icon off to the side to make sure you get notifications of when I release new videos every Thursday. Come and experience art history with me. The Raft of the Medusa was created at the beginning of the Romanticism art movement, which started at the 1800s and went to 1850. Now, Jericho was neoclassically trained. He had that as his foundation when creating his artwork. But after traveling to Italy and studying the great Baroque artists there, he decided to use some of those elements in his artwork, which helped usher in this romantic movement. Now he created this piece, the Raft of the Medusa, on a larger than life scale. I mean larger than life. This thing is 16 feet by 23 and a half feet. It's massive. There's no escaping this. Now, it's a contemporary piece, but it's also a history piece. What I mean by that is it technically is showing a historical moment, but it was painted two years after the event happened. Here's the story. In the year 1816, a ship was headed from France to the coast of Africa. Now, the captain was very incompetent. He was assigned to the ship as a political statement. He hadn't sailed for over 20 years, and he didn't really know what he was doing. So, because of his incompetence, he ended up veering off course and grounding the ship. Eventually, it capsized, and he and all of the people on the ship were in a state of emergency. Now, typically when a ship starts to sink, the last person off the boat is the captain, and oftentimes the captain doesn't survive. In this case though, the captain was the first off the ship. He jumped ship real quickly with all of his top commanders. They got on one of the few lifeboats that were available to them. Scrambling, the other 147 passengers on the ship hurriedly put together a raft and decided that they were going to be pulled by the lifeboat and the captain. After a few short hours, they realized it wasn't going to work. The captain cut ropes and saved himself. Left at sea, the passengers on the raft of the Medusa were left to the survival skills. When the raft was finally rescued, there were only 15 survivors left. Of those 15, the artist Theodore Gericault actually interviewed two of the survivors. And from those interviews, he learned a lot about what happened on that ship. There were lots of rumors and lots of truths mixed in. But essentially what happened was people turned wild. They tried to survive. There was uprisings, fighting, people throwing weak passengers off the raft to save room and supplies. When the few supplies they did have ran out, they turned to cannibalism, trying whatever they could to stay alive. As I'm sure you can imagine, it was a harrowing event for those 15 survivors, and often they didn't talk about what happened. The captain was put on trial for his crimes, and he was convicted, although he did have a very light sentence. Now, this was all happening at the fall of Napoleon's empire, where he was exiled, and France decided to reinstate the monarchy. The captain of the ship was a monarch sympathizer, and that's why he got away with barely a tap on his hand. Jericho saw this as an opportunity to paint something the world would not soon forget. He painted the scene two years after the event happened, and it only took him eight months. During those eight months, he did intense research to figure out the best way possible to draw the viewer in. First and foremost, he interviewed survivors. He heard firsthand accounts. He gathered his resources so that he could represent what truly happened. Also, he attended the trial so he could hear more testimony and get a feel for the captain and what he was like. Finally, he was really obsessed with getting things right, and he didn't really know the color of dead flesh. So he went to morgues and studied that color, bringing home body pieces, including a severed head, so that he could really figure out how to depict the reality that these people experienced. 
So how did Jericho go about bringing this piece to life? How did he draw you in as a viewer? Jericho wanted you to feel and experience this work of art. He does this in three specific ways. The use of his composition in line, how he depicts his figures, and the color palette he used. First thing I want to talk about is the composition and line that he uses. It's very dramatic and really pulls us in. First, I want to talk about the moment he decides to depict. This is the moment of those few survivors when they see help is on the way. In fact, if you look at the horizon, really teeny tiny all the way in the back, you can see a little speck of a boat headed their way. This is the climax of the story. This is the apex. This is after 13 days in sea, after all of these horrible events they've just witnessed, and they see light. They see rescue. They see the end. It's in sight. So it's a very emotional moment, I'm sure, as you can imagine. Um, and you feel that emotion just as you see this. Now, part of that emotion comes from the composition of the piece. So this is done in a pyramid structure. Uh, you have at the very top of the pyramid that young man kind of holding a flag in his hand. And you can see two really strong diagonal lines that make up a triangle. And then right here, you can also see a third line coming off which gives us this pyramid base. You have a second pyramid here, actually. The mast of this raft is the apex, that top part, and you can see it also kind of brings down, just following those lines, also creates this pyramid shape. Now, the pyramid shape comes from the Renaissance. Uh, Leonardo, Raphael, they all use this pyramid shape. It gave the structure really good foundation. That's why it feels really heavy at the bottom of the piece, but it also helps draw your eye to what you're supposed to be looking at. So essentially at the beginning, when you look at this piece, you're kind of just drawn to the center of the piece, but those diagonal lines and that pyramid structure draw your eye to kind of main focuses of the piece. The first is that person kind of waving for freedom. The second is kind of an older man. He's got a shawl on and he holds another figure who looks deceased. Um, it's been interpreted that this could be his son that he's holding, but here it draws your attention to the other aspect of this raft. Survival and also the macabre. The other thing this piece has compositionally is those two pyramids actually intersect and create this strong diagonal X. Um, that gives a lot of energy and intensity to the piece and you can feel that as you look at the waves that are coming um, you can see the white caps and the froth, the way the bodies are kind of just like shoved together. You can feel the chaos. You can feel um, this intense energy, but also that strong X with those strong diagonals give you that feeling as well. Now, remember this piece is massive. It's 16 um, feet tall and it's 23 feet long. So where your eye hits is about right at the beginning of the raft. You can see how the two points come into your space and it's kind of open. That's for you. That's where you are. So we're kind of on this tilted plane here with the raft. It's tilted upwards so that we can access it. Um, but also having that point jut out into our space invites us into the piece and we become a, a survivor or we become a participant in this event and right in front of your face you see the deceased bodies the base of that pyramid and again your eyes could climb upward to toward that salvation all right the second thing uh Jericho does to kind of draw us in is how he depicts his figures now he's really um into depicting the common man but you can see that he has this italian influence with him also. A lot of the figures are very muscular. Um, they look healthy and strong, but after 13 days stranded on, you know, a ship and uh, fighting for your life and your survival in as many ways as you can, I'm not quite sure their figures would actually look this way. So he does focus a lot on the male nude. You can see that in how a lot of passengers have their shirts removed. Um, and how some of the deceased have all of their clothing removed. So he's showing his talent, yes, of, you know, his Renaissance figuring, but also it's to show the humanness of these, fig of these people, right? They're real people, real survivors, real deceased 
people, brothers, fathers, sons. Um, and so he focuses on that male anatomy to kind of give us the vibe that these people were full of life. That's who they were. Um, other interesting things, as you look at the piece, you can start to notice lots of different emotions. I mentioned uh, a lot of romantic artists like to use the body as a way to express emotion. So I just want to draw your attention to a couple of those emotions we see. First, let's go back to this older man with the red shawl that he's covered um, in. He has a lot of emotions on his face to me. It looks, obviously there's some sadness there as he holds this deceased figure, but also he almost looks bored to me, like he's given up. There's this kind of like despondent type of vibe that he has here. So that's very easy to relate to in a situation like this. As you look at other figures' faces, uh, some of these men look hopeful. You can see the one man that's pointing out to the ship, turning back to his comrade, saying, look, here's, here's freedom. You can see there's hope, but you can also see that a lot of them are starting to give up. And so through their body language, through their facial expressions, you can start to feel this experience and how exhausting and terrifying and inhumane this is on so many levels. Another thing I want to point out is in this piece, there are actually four black figures being depicted. And the central figure is actually a black man who's waving his shirt at the top of that pyramid. Um, some have mentioned that Jericho was an abolitionist, and this was a political statement that he was making, depicting these men as survivors, as part of the human race, and actually as an important part to the story. The other thing about the figures are the figures tell the story. So remember Jericho interviewed survivors, he went to the trial, he actually, this is wild, he actually created the raft in his studio to the exact specifications as was recorded in history. So he rebuilds this raft so that he can get it right. So this feels like a very historically accurate document that we're looking at here actually. So the thing he does with the figures is the figures tell the story. They allude to some of those atrocities and macabre events that happened. We can see a lot of death and decay in this piece, especially as you look at that base where we enter the scene. You have figures hanging off into the water. It looks like tragedy, right? It looks sad. It looks emotional. You can see the color of death on these figures as opposed to the color of life on the others. It's an amazing juxtaposition that he does. But there were also rumors of cannibalism happening, and Jericho actually references these with some of these figures. So first and foremost, in the left corner there, you can see a deceased figure who looks actually deceased because Jericho was really good at his craft. But it also looks as if he might just be a torso um, that's kind of floating there. Now, it could be that his legs are actually under the raft, and this is just all speculation. But again, your mind kind of plays tricks on you as you're thinking there was cannibalism happening here on this ship, and that's how we read into that figure. Another that some people have mentioned <clears throat> is off to the right. You can see that man is draped over another man reaching for the ship. Now, whether this man is deceased or not, it does look as if he is chewing into the hip of the other man. So again, more references to what's happening, but these figures tell the story and they give us that emotional response. Okay, the final thing is to talk about color. Color is really interesting. It's very Baroque, very earthy in tones. Notice how it's very dark. So he uses Caravaggio-esque styles of tenebrism <clears throat> and chiaroscuro as he kind of juxtaposes the light versus the dark. You can see the majority of the people have these dark shadows on them. Whether or not that's symbolism as to the dark deeds that they've done or just the darkness of the experience, you can definitely read some of that into this. Um, but he chooses lifeless colors. He chooses browns and creams and golds. Even those waves, if you look at those, they could have been the bright blue of the ocean, but instead he uses this dark green to really just bring it down to our level, to bring it to earth, 
to make it feel raw and real and lifeless almost. Notice the only light in the piece is coming from the horizon. The only color we do see in this piece that isn't like a brown or gray, you see little hints of red, you see it in that man's shawl, you see it in the flag that the man at the top of the pyramid waves, you see it in a sash and some clothing, you see red, you see white in some of the deceased figures in the other shawl that's being waved, um, and then you can see a little hint of blue in the water surrounding. Now these are the colors of the French flag. Read what you want to into that. This is obviously a politically heavy piece. So these depictions of the French flag's color could be Jericho's way of saying like, this is French. This is what happens in France. So the colors he uses in this piece give us the impression that this is the moment right before dawn. That moment where the earth is the coldest, the moment where things seem dreary, and then all of a sudden the sun peaks up over the horizon and a ship can be seen. So this is my personal interpretation, perhaps my own personal allegory, but in the midst of all of this sadness, this destruction, this decay, this loss, this tragedy, there is a horizon and there is a light. And I don't know about you, but for me, that means a lot. To see how the Romantic art movement fits into art history's timeline, make sure you download my European art history brief timeline located in the description below. Please feel free to comment on this video, ask questions, um, tell me more of your favorite Romantic art pieces, or give me suggestions on pieces you want me to dive into. I'd love to hear from you guys. I'm willing to talk. And if you found this video helpful, click that like button, share it with your friends. Please make sure you subscribe to the channel. You'll get updates every Thursday on new art history videos that I post. And I will see you guys next time where the art just keeps getting better.